is that the Russians don't see Ukraine as the end of the war, but the beginning of the war, and they want to push past Ukraine further on until they hit a geographic area that they feel they can defend. This isn't going to be a one-off. This is not about carving a small piece out of Ukraine. This is just the start of a much longer conflict. And in that sort of environment, you've got to take into account how oil moves. So the Druzba pipeline that goes into East Germany, unless and until there is destruction of the pipeline, either because the Russians accidentally hit it with an artillery shell or Ukrainian partisans blow it up, it's fine for now. It's not going to be there in three months, but for now that continues to flow because the German refineries don't have other options. They're not on ports, so they can't even truck in oil from elsewhere. It's the pipeline or nothing. So that's going to be probably the one that goes last. Novorossiysk on the Black Sea is in a war zone. So it's very difficult for ships to get insurance to even sail there at all. So they're operated at maybe 20% capacity on a good day. And that's not just Russian crewed, that's also Kazakh crewed. The CPC project out in Tengiz on the Caspian, that all goes to Novorossiysk and the Tengiz project is about to shut down now because they can't get anything out. All of this is backing up the pressure. The facility on the Black Sea is now not the only one. There's been about 20 others that have either slowed or even stopped runs because they have no where to put their refining product. All that leaves is Primorsk on the Baltic. Now that is a big discharge point. You're talking about 1.6 million barrels a day. That's not insignificant, but it's a shallow water port, so no super tanker. So it's only shuttle tankers. Shuttle tankers have limited range that pretty much only goes to Northern Europe. And if you want to send it further, you have to get six or seven of those things together and do a sea to sea transfer in the territorial waters of a NATO state in order to send it on. And that is not a viable long or even midterm option. So we're seeing the pressure building up already and probably within a month or two, they're going to be forced to shut in production for the long term. The Russians didn't get everything back online until December of 2021. That 30 years that it took them to get it back online, that included work by BP and Shell and Exxon and Schlumberger and Halliburton and Baker Hughes. They're all gone now. Yeah, at a minimum, you're talking about needing to have a replacement government for the Putin regime. Well, the Putin, the Russian government would need a completely new leadership cadre. It's not clear that one even exists. And then they would have to hold the line and generate stability lasting at least 10 years before you could even start the real work. So we're, we're getting to a point where everyone but the Germans are cutting Russian energy out of their equation. And even the Germans are bending over backwards to try to build alternate infrastructure, but they're the ones that have the furthest to go. So it's just gonna take a little bit longer. But at some point this summer, assuming that the oil is still flowing, the European demand for that stuff is going to drop and there's no way that the Europeans are going to keep their waterways open in order to facilitate other people benefiting from what they're paying for. So one way or the other, we are looking at the end of open seas in many areas for oil transport. We're not there yet. So I'm just spitballing here, but my best guess is that the Turks would manage to carve out an exemption for themselves so that they could still get crude access and food access on the Black Sea because they are a littoral state. But it's really difficult for it to see anything beyond that. No, the, the 2015 bill uh, is what allowed the United States to export crude in the first place. Until then, we had not exported crude except for by executive exemption going back to 1973. Uh, so in 2015, we shifted with the law so that crude could be directly exported without a presidential exemption any longer. That is the part that can be reconstituted by executive order from the president, but it does not include any other energy or energy products. So not LNG, not natural gas, not refined product, not electricity. So we would be entering in a world where the United States supply of light sweet that until now has gone worldwide, that is removed but American refiners could still export their surplus refined product and American importers could still access international crude if they wanted to. But this is gonna generate such a huge price disconnect in a post-Russian oil environment that we're talking about an environment with a functional ceiling in the United States and probably Canada of about 70 to 80, and then a functional floor everywhere else that is at, at the absolute minimum like 170. And so in that environment, if you want to import crude in the United States, you have to really, really want it because you're going to pay a lot for it. Well, if you go back to February 22nd, the day before the war started, I would say that the idea of getting more pipelines from Alberta into the United States was a dead letter, that uh, we had multiple administrations 
that were for or against it and nothing happened. And if it wasn't going to happen under Donald Trump, it wasn't going to happen, period. But now we're staring down a global energy shock. And that's going to change a lot of people's minds when it comes to energy security issues. But never forget that Biden, like Trump, like Obama, is a populist. And so he's not going to do things based on the economic numbers unless those economic numbers are something that directly impacts his political standing. So in the United States, gasoline prices are a hot button issue right now. And because of what's going on in Russia, they have gone up. And with what's about to happen in Russia, they're going to go up substantially. The oil export ban will help contain the damage. But in that environment, Albertan crude is being sold into a closed market and it's not available for export. So you would be stuck getting the mid-continental price for oil within the United States, which will probably never go above 80 again because of the changes that are coming. There would be a, a elasticity in all the products globally that you don't think that could happen? I don't think this can happen with crude. Now, you, that can change with an act of Congress, but Congress is slow and there are a number of factions involved and they would probably, most of them would probably be thrilled with having a, a cap on what oil prices in the United States can be. <clears throat> now you're right that there will be an elasticity in other things, especially refined product, because if you can buy crude for 60 to $80 in North America as a refiner and then sell it into a global market where it's below or above 170, I mean, that's sure. a slam dunk business decision. So we're gonna see this explosion in uh, refining capacity expansion in the United States, specifically along the Texas coast to take advantage of that differential. The elasticity that we're likely to see is gonna be in other things. For example, California didn't participate in the shale revolution. They're not linked into the American oil transport grid in any appreciable way. And they are the state that imports the most crude. So I can see California having a price differential that is much more similar to what we're gonna have in East Asia than what it is in the rest of the United States. And so Americans will have the option of an arbitrage internally that could make them a lot of money. As for Canada, you guys are in a super saturated market and you're selling into a super saturated market. You're actually more insulated from the global price pressures than almost all Americans. Now, if you're an oil consumer in Canada, that's great. If you're an oil producer, it's the other thing. Well, uh, the problem with California is going to be crude quality. Um, <laughs> they're the, yeah. the, one, the, the few refineries that we have in the United States that actually do prefer the light sweep. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing with crude right now is we know we're going to lose four to five million barrels a day of, of Russian crude. That is going to force the Europeans to go re-interface with a lot of their former colonies in Africa to make sure that crude goes north instead of east, which means that you're going to have this massive shortage in the Chinese market. They're not going to be able to function if they lose half their energy. So in the time that it takes a new pipeline to get stuff off to the Pacific, there's probably not going to be a Chinese economy to sell to it.